All right, gang, I think we'll get started here. I know there's still a few more people who have registered who aren't on yet, but we'll see if they might join us as we as we continue forward. Uh, this is Brandon Bassett at Pine Cove Consulting. I wanna thank each of you guys for joining us on this webinar today. I really appreciate you guys taking some time out of your schedules to, uh, to join us to talk today about some website ADA compliance. Uh, as you guys, many of you will know, um, Pine Cove Consulting is a IT consulting company based in Bozeman, Montana, and we do work across Montana and Wyoming mainly. Uh, but you'll see from our map there that we have branched outside of that a little bit, but mostly uh, those have been special circumstances and grants and things like that. The majority of the work we do is with uh, K-12 schools and small to medium businesses in Montana and Wyoming. We're excited that uh, this year is it's our 25th year. We have We had a a 25 year celebration a few weeks ago. Um, some of you might have been able to, to, uh, to join us for that, which was a lot of fun. Um, you know, we're a cybersecurity focused company, but we also provide IT services ranging from infrastructure to support and uh, a variety of communication platforms as well. One thing about us, uh, we've probably interacted with quite a few of you as we serve on the Meta Network Security Council. Uh, which has been exciting in helping to create some policies and some ideas for uh, standardization and just helping school districts um, across Montana to get a grasp on cybersecurity and how we want to tackle that together because it's a it's a big animal. And so uh, the more more hands on deck, I think the better for that. And we're happy to be involved there. Uh, additionally, you know, just some of the things, some of the stats that we that we carrier you know we support more than 20,000 users each day we've implemented a variety of different networks from servers to uh, networking wireless uh, phones and video conferencing and, and everything in between that too and so uh, with that today uh, we're going to be joined by Gabbert Communications and uh, uh, the reason that we partnered with them, as you'll find out here when I kick it over to Scott Condit, uh, is not just because they had the coolest accents that we had heard at the conference that we met them at. Uh, him being a, the, the company that he's with is based, I believe, in Oklahoma. Uh, but we met Scott and uh, Teddy Gabbert at a, at a conference about a year ago now. And uh, we'd had a lot of customers who had asked us for help with websites. And it's not, not really a specialty of Pine Cove. And so we've been looking for a company who we could work with and felt that they did quality work, good people that we thought we could that we could work with and uh, feel comfortable when we re, uh, when we refer our customers to somebody. And uh, and these guys fit that bill. They're 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 good people and uh, their product is really good, too. We've, we've seen a lot of the, the samples of their work and visited a lot of the websites that they've helped to develop and to manage. And uh, it's, it's very impressive. And, uh, and we've enjoyed our partnership and just uh, our, our networking with them so far the last year. Um, the reason we're here is because a, a lot of people have been asking us, how do they, how do they manage their website? And what are other people doing? And also the, the, the issue of ADA compliance has popped up a lot. We had a few districts that we work with who've received letters of, of uh, notices that their website was not ADA compliant and that they needed to make adjustments to uh, to make sure that they were following all the compliance issues uh, immediately. And so when we heard those things, where, where did we need to look? And we looked to Gabbert for some assistance in that. And so, uh, and, and just real quick before I kick it over to Scott, um, you know, we uh, if you have any questions as we move along, uh, type them into the questions tab and I will try to manage those and make sure that we get any of those answered for you. Uh, we're going to be on here about 30 or 40 minutes today, so hope to not take up too much of your time, but I know that the guys have a lot of information to share with us and I, I believe it's going to be some great stuff. Uh, another thing, just so you know, um, you know, we host these webinars each month and you can see there on your screen uh, the last three that we posted have been SoCo's Mobile Protection. We did Ruckus Cloud Path in December. And in January, we did a cybersecurity outlook webinar. And each of those webinars can be viewed again on Pine Cove Consulting's YouTube page. So if you would like to take a look at any past content, please visit that. Um, and then also, 
Uh, next month, we're going to be talking about Fish Threat, which is a training program to help educate your staff uh, things to be wary on with, uh, as far as fishing campaigns go when people are trying to uh, to put out these emails to gather critical data from your companies. And so uh, join us for that if you if you can. We'll be sending out a registration link for that in the future. But with that said, I would like to hand this over to Scott Condit, who will also introduce Chris. And uh, Chris, I'm going to give you presenter uh, control here too. So Scott, why don't you go ahead and, and uh, thanks everybody again for joining. Awesome. Thanks, Brandon. Appreciate that. Um, um, definitely appreciate the the recognition on the on the accent. I didn't realize I had one, uh, but I appreciate you pointing that out to me. Uh, we're uh, we're we feel the same way in, in as Gabbert in our partnership with uh, with Pine Co. Um, and I think we operate very similar similarly, where we are um, uh, really hesitant about recommending uh, other companies. We had experience with them, know how they operate, um, feel them out, that they work like we do, and we feel exactly that way about Pine Cove. So it's it's been a fantastic relationship um, since since we met last year, and uh, we're we're looking forward to a to a long lasting uh, relationship and, and supporting each other and, and supporting each other's customers in any way that we can. Uh, Gabber Communications, just real quick, kind of a background on us. Um, we do uh, we do websites. That's been our been our that's been our biggest part of our business. We've been doing websites specifically since 2007. Uh, we currently have a 96.4 percent renewal rate with all of our customers since 2007. So we, we hang our hat on that one. We think we're, we're pretty proud of that. Uh, we think it reflects the uh, the appreciation that our customers have for the quality products and and service that we sell. Uh, number one feedback we get from our customers regarding our websites is it's the easiest to use uh, content management system they've ever dealt with. Um, and then the, the close second, probably like a 1A uh, feedback we get from our customers is that we set the bar in the industry on customer support. So we, we, we respond immediately to customers. We don't leave people uh, hanging. We don't want to be a, a roadblock in, in, in you guys being able to conduct your uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, so uh, we really strive to set that bar high in taking care of our customers. Uh, in addition to websites, um, we also have a, uh, a parent notification system where you can email, voice call, and uh, text your parents and members of the community just through the website itself, so it gives you that one, one pane of glass functionality. Uh, you don't have to log into multiple screens or anything like that. Uh, we also offer a dedicated app that's available for school districts in the uh, same kind of scenario. You can uh, manage that through the uh, website as well. And we've uh, we've actually rolled out a learning management system this year. We're, uh, I think we're gluttons for punishment, but we like to say we're, we're trying to be well-rounded and be able to offer school districts all the tools that they, that they would need. Uh, and we've been working on that for a couple of years in development, and, and this is our launch year for that. Um, we've got currently about, we've just crossed over the 500 school districts threshold. Uh, we're mainly in the south central plains, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Louisiana, Arkansas, Missouri. Uh, we've, we expanded into Wyoming last year, and so we're, we're currently in Wyoming as well. And um, we saw some interest in Montana, and I knew some great guys in Montana that go by the name of Pine Cove, so I reached out to them, and, and we actually ended up at the... Um, the uh, school administrators of Montana conference uh, last week or before last. So uh, we're, we're happy to be in Montana. We're, um, we, we love taking care of our customers. We only do schools. Uh, we like to say we're built by educators for educators. So pretty much everybody in our company is uh, related to education of educators or married educators or former educators. So um, this, this is the world that we live in and we know and breathe and our, and our families live in the same world. So uh, we, we take that into, into account in everything that we do. So uh, anyway, that's like I said, that's kind of just a quick background on us. Um, again, my name is Scott Conduct. I'm the account manager for uh, for uh, Montana and, and Wyoming. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Chris Yee, who is our um, sales uh, director of sales and marketing. And uh, I'll let him, he's driving, he'll drive the webinar presentation from this point forward and I'll let him take over. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. Thank you, Brandon, Jace. Um, we, uh, we'll just echo the same sentiments as 
uh, it's, it's an honor for us to get to partner with companies and further education, better communications, and uh, just really a better understanding of what the climate is for, for what's being discussed in, uh, in education right now across the United States. And this is absolutely one of the hottest topics out there right now. And uh, I want to thank all of you for joining and uh, recognizing the importance of what, what we're going to be discussing today. So uh, as, as the, the uh, uh, webinar is titled, you know, is your, is your website a lawsuit waiting to happen? So just a, a brief rundown. What's been happening over the, over the last about two and a half years, this has really grown legs to where uh, we now have to account for website accessibility and really understanding what does that mean uh, when we've had a previous, uh, I, I guess, uh, understanding of what accessibility meant before, because most often when you talk to school districts, you talk to people within school districts, you mention the word uh, accessibility or 504, Section 504, uh, you're, you're thinking of like wheelchair ramps, uh, uh, bathroom access, elevators, things like that to help those with disabilities get access to certain areas of the school district and so on. Uh, now that digital communication is such a fabric of our society, uh, it's now spilled over into those communications because this is just how we communicate these days. Uh, it's kind of gone are the days of you know, communicating through paper handouts and, and uh, though, you know, even we're seeing less and less communication via email back and forth. So now we're spilling into this digital communication uh, uh, time and this climate now where we have to make sure we're, we're understanding what it is to be accessible. Um, and what we need to do to check and make sure we are. And, and really, that starts with a few things here. So overview, accessibility, web accessibility, and understanding the people with disabilities that will actually be using your website. Um, so it, it, really understanding those points and those things are, are, are going to be key to your success, uh, short term and long term. Um, and, and we'll dive into this a little bit more. And also, I'll preface this uh, before we get into it is, um, if anybody wants this information or a copy of this PowerPoint, please reach out to Brandon or Scott or someone. We will make sure and get you this information because I know a lot of what we're going to cover today also uh, covers a lot of legal ease, which is not necessarily the most uh, exciting thing and riveting thing to cover in a, in a presentation. So having said that, what is web accessibility? So web accessibility is where those with disabilities, whether it's a senior citizen that's, uh, that has mobile skill or mobile uh, trouble, can't actually, you know, lift their arms to go move a mouse and a keyboard or visually impaired if they're blind. Uh, we just give you some uh, scenarios here. Maybe a parent who is blind who can't pay for the school fees on the website or who can. Um, we need to make sure that they have access to do that and how do they do those things. A uh, student who is colorblind can look at homework at home. So the, it's not just the severe disabilities like blindness and those things. It's even those with uh, colorblindness. And uh, Scott's actually one of those that, that is. So the, these are things he can speak to firsthand of the struggle and challenges he has by, by doing these types of things. So uh, someone who's hearing impaired or a grandparent with low vision. These are all those types of things that are very real that are happening out there every day. And I don't know if you saw it on the previous slide, but there are uh, uh, roughly about 57 million people in the United States uh, that have classified disabilities. Um, and here's what you'll run into when people are going to your websites to get information. You'll see visual disabilities such as no vision, low vision, literal or, or no color perception, auditory disabilities, so they can't hear, they're limited in their hearing, uh, users with assisted devices, speech disabilities, cognitive, physical, uh, any combination of those you're going to run into at some point in your community um, and your patrons that are going and visiting your website to gain information. Um, so th those are things, again, to be aware of. And here's an example. If any of you are colorblind on this, uh, this call, you'll actually uh, kind of run into what, uh, what I talked to Scott earlier when we were going through this, is he can see the number 16 and the number 8, but he can't see all the other numbers that are blended in within this color combination. Um, so color contrast is a big part of making sure you have a effective communicating website because your background color versus your font color that you have on top of that, it actually could make it to where somebody can't actually even see what the font is on that page. Um, so again, these are, these are the types of things you want to be thinking about um, as you're working on your sites, uh, whether you're with, you know, use Gabbard or not. These are all things that apply uh, regardless. So color blindness, uh, additional um, uh, uh, visual impairments, such as no color perception at all, where pretty much what they see is a grayscale um, when they go to 
you know, it, basically anything. They see basically a grayscale or black and white, uh, however you want to refer to it as when they're, uh, when they're visually looking around. Um, assistive technology is one of the most famous people in the world, Stephen Hawking. He actually uses a, an assistive device. Now, uh, he probably has access to a much more high-tech one than most people have. Uh, but he's got these types of uh, devices that you can, he can actually look at something on the screen and it'll follow along and he can actually click on words, uh, things on, on websites or just information, um, but all types of different tools that people are using out there. My uncle is actually blind. He's completely blind um, and he spends about 70% of his time most days on the internet, either hearing about news or uh, getting information, just, 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 you know, it's, it's a world of information on the internet out there. Um, and that's how we have to think about this when we go through it. So examples of devices are like screen readers, refreshable braille, uh, screen magnifiers, voice recognition software, keyboard, closed captions, hearing aids, and word prediction softwares. Uh, that's just a few of the things that are out there. So definitely take some time and get familiar with what devices people are going to be using and then we can go through and, and help you understand uh, better how to set up your website so those devices work. Um, and we'll get into a little bit more detail about uh, those devices and what, the, what they do and what they're going to be using them for. Um, but to kind of really understand ADA compliance and where we're at and where we're moving to, um, you'll see right here that the uh, this really goes back to the Section 504 like I talked about. In 1973 is when all of the uh, accessibility uh, statutes and laws started coming about to where we needed to start providing access to those with disabilities at that time was really geared and designed for uh, physical, like actual physical buildings and so on. Uh, Title II enhanced that even more to say, hey, okay, now we need to take a look at this. Now we need to uh, dig a little bit deeper because we have more devices out there people are using, wheelchairs and so on where they can get access to other areas maybe they didn't have before. So they refined it even more. And now when, when Title II came out, this spilled over into the public sector. So your uh, government offices, your education uh, buildings, whether it's a university or a K-12 district, um, they, they now spilled over to where there were certain requirements that had to be, had, uh, had to be done within those organizations. Um, and there, again, there, we have a detailed version with a lot of legalese describing these uh, types of uh, uh, title, Title II and Section 504. So if you do want more details, uh, please let us know and we'll be more than happy to get those to you. Um, in addition to that, uh, you'll also be able to uh, understand that when website or when internet was invented, uh, they were basing ADA compliance originally off of a few years ago, these old statutes, the, these things that applied to physical buildings, but the internet was actually created in 1990, uh, shortly after that, into the 1993, we're getting into actual websites um, and so on. So uh, a lot of the old requirements were being applied to uh, these now digital requirements, uh, which didn't make a whole lot of sense, honestly, and, and they knew it too. So they spent the last uh, maybe five or six years really trying to refine what it means to be ADA compliant with digital communications. Um, so kind of fast forward into May of 2016, uh, the DOJ issued a, a supplemental advance notice of proposed rulemaking, which contemplates that WCAG 2.0 level AA standards will be the standard for web content and uh, entities that uh, are going to be using this. So whether it's education, whether it's uh, healthcare, government, um, these standards are the required standards now. Uh, so if you haven't dove into these standards or gotten a real understanding of them, please take that time to do so. We even provide you with a link right down here where it says www.gabbert.com slash COSA, and it's got all the details about the WCAG 2.0 level AA standards in single A. So even though it says level AA standards, it's also including uh, kind of the blanket is single A standards. There are actually even AAA standards, but uh, the, the school districts are not required uh, to do AAA standards yet. I, I think that's something that's coming in the future, but as of right now, they're wanting schools to remediate their sites, uh, fix things to where they fit within those standards. So that, that's something very important to know um, is that uh, WCAG 2.0 and get really familiar with it. So how did this all start? How did this all uh, start this all this buzz between superintendents and tech directors and schools? How did this all go about to where um, everybody's now talking about ADA compliance? 
Well, it started with a, a lady named Marcy Lipset in Michigan, um, a civil rights advocate um, that started this whole process. Basically, she had filed a complaint to the OCR on the school district in her town. And that, that complaint went through. There was a lawsuit filed. They won. The school actually had to pay a lot of, a lot of money for it. Um, so it then turned into now it, it made her look at other school districts outside of her town. And just to give you an example of how fast this has grown, she has filed over 2,000 complaints just on her own, uh, 2,000 complaints since May of 2016. Um, so she's now the, um, the so-called, uh, I guess, leader of this movement. Um, and has created a Facebook following and really just ha has uh, established this, uh, this, this forum for people to go in to where there's now people looking at websites all across the United States. Um, and, and we're seeing left and right. We're seeing uh, uh, school districts get letters from the OCR, uh, get complaints filed against them. They have to go through an, a remediation process, which if you haven't heard about it or you haven't investigated uh, from what I've heard, and we've seen it firsthand from, you know, clients that were not customers of ours that needed our help. Um, we, we, we've, it's, it, they, they basically equate it to a tax audit on steroids is really what you have to go through to remediate this. And you only have a short period of time to do it before it's then open for that original uh, complaint filer to actually pursue litigation. Um, and that's ultimately the goal they're trying to get to at this point is try to get schools into litigation that are not meeting these uh, these needs, these people that are out there like Marcy uh, making these complaints. Um, to us, being a company, like Scott said, being built by educators for educators, um, to us it's kind of, kind of a slap in the face just because we know firsthand what you all do on a day-to-day -day basis to bend over backwards to provide, provide access uh, to students with disabilities. And... Uh, to us, it's just it's kind of a rough start to this whole ADA compliance process. So it's for schools to scramble around, try to find out what this is, try to understand and do the best they can. Uh, but fortunately for you all is Gabber. We have spent the last two and a half years, the owner of our company has been working directly uh, with one of the leaders in the OCR uh, out of Dallas, Texas, that reports directly to Washington, D.C. One, to make sure we really understood what it meant to be ADA compliant. And then number two is to make sure that our customers, uh, you know, wouldn't have any complaints filed against them. So knock on wood, to, to date, we have not had any of our customers get complaints filed against them. And that's mainly because of all of our hard work behind the scenes uh, to hopefully help take some of that burden off of them of understanding what they need to do or what has to happen. So we've built a lot of safety nets in our system. And I'm going to show you one of those in just a little bit, one of the most common mistakes that schools make with ADA compliance. I'll actually demonstrate that in a little bit and show you how easy we make it for our clients to remediate. Um, so what, what we're going to look at now is, is when OCR goes out and they receive a complaint for someone, they actually go out and test the site. And there's several things they're testing for. Uh, there's 10 items. And here's the first five. If one is tap through functionality. Two is page titles change and are not blank when navigating through the website. Text equivalent elements exist. So you'll commonly hear that as like alt tags. Uh, more descriptive tags uh, is what that's referred to. Number four is keyboard controls work for on-key, uh, on-click and on-key uh, press. And then number five is color contrast. We break these down a little bit more to understand what they are. So keyboard accessibility means that if someone can, gets on a keyboard, they need to have the ability to be able to tab through the whole website and the website be able to read off to them what it is. Um, a lot of these uh, people with disabilities, like my uncle, he has his keyboard connected to a screen reader. And whenever he taps through a website, when he ever taps over a paragraph, uh, a main link, a picture, a video, it describes to him what it is he's actually landed on. And a lot of times we kind of take that for granted, but if you think about it, I would challenge all of you to go to your website, close your eyes, and try to navigate through your website uh, without looking and see how challenging it can be. Uh, that way you'll get a better understanding of what it is that these with disabilities are facing when they access the website. So while, while we feel like it's kind of a slap in the face to, uh, uh, you know, go after schools like this, like they have, um, we also at the same time want to be, make our, our websites better and more accessible um, to the public and so on. So uh, this gives you an example of just how a keyboard can be used um, for, for different things. So visual focus indicator. Uh, focus uh, must follow a logical order. So that means that that your website needs to be laid out in a logical order. 
this helps. This really helps when you make sure you partner with a company that has a real understanding of what that means. Because like for instance, Gabbert, we have a professional graphic artist that has put a ton of designs together and it's very intentional on how the designs are laid out. It's, it's laid out so one, it covers ADA compliance, but also makes it more effective at communicating with your uh, community, parents, and, and, and so on. So uh, keeping that in mind is, is making sure making sure that uh, you're doing the best you can. Uh, text equivalent or alt tags. Once again, when my uncle tabs over something, if it doesn't have an alt tag or descriptive tag, it's not going to read off to him what that says. So he has no clue what it is that he's tabbed over. Um, in the instance that that happens, it doesn't have the tag or links or things like that. Um, color contrast, again, kind of going back, making sure that we address our color contrasts uh, and make sure that those colors aren't uh, uh, counter countering against each other for those with color blindness um, and so on. And then also color ca contrast requirements. If you if you know all about colors and you're like a graphic artist type person, uh, feel free to jot down some of this information, but contrast ratios need to be 4.5.1. Um, and it, again, if you're a graphic artist, you'll understand what that means. If not, um, that's where, again, partnering with a company like us that has a professional graphic artist that understands this intimately uh, makes it much, much easier for your school uh, to not have to worry about color contrast. Um, but also size of your of your text that you that you have on your website that also matters as well because if you get senior citizens that are on there that have low vision uh, have a hard time seeing um, those are things again that you need to account for for your community so moving on to the other six other five things that they test for is screen reader tested uh, linked PDFs can be read by screen readers this is probably one of the most challenging areas uh, for school districts is the the PDFs because most of you probably have an archive of board policies or something like that that has maybe over a thousand documents in it each one of those documents if they were not created by adobe dc pro uh, they are not accessible so there's things that we can help you with to do that and that's something you might want to jot down as a note uh, going forward if you don't have adobe dc uh, you want to make sure and get that for your school district because anytime you put pdfs out you're going to want to make sure that they're accessible and it saves a ton of time and a ton of effort um, on your part. Now, there are some things you can do. For instance, let's say you do have a board policies area where you have all these documents. At the header of that, you can actually put a link to an online form. Like what our customers do is they will put a link to an online submittable form they created through our system to where somebody can request an accessible version of certain policies or all the policies or whatever they need. Uh, that way it covers you for the OC, uh, ADA compliance, but also uh, helps you give you, buy you some time, so to speak, uh, to remediate those PDFs um, that they come, as they come through. So uh, public graphics have descriptive alt tags. So we just talked about that. They're also testing to make sure public videos have closed captions or transcripts. Um, there's a lot of misconception on videos on websites that are being spread around by other vendors. And uh, uh, they're saying that videos have to have both captions and transcripts. Um, that's actually not true. We, we've heard it directly from OCR that it has to have one or the other. So there are tools that I'll show you here in a little bit that will help you with closed captions on your video. And we even have built-in stuff into our system as well that will help you. Uh, the, net, the last thing is the video player controls for pause, play, and forward. Um, you have to make sure that they can be controlled by a keyboard, so the actual video functions. Uh, can be controlled by a keyboard. So one of the questions we always get asked is what's considered a public picture or video or AM video. Uh, public pictures and videos are forward facing on your website. So think of it as like stuff that's on your home page, maybe not necessarily like on a teacher's website where you had to dig down four layers to get to the teacher's website or something like that. It's basically the stuff up front that you are uh, publishing to to your community. So public uh, pictures and forward-facing uh, items, uh, that's what that's considered as. Um, so like school bond information, school board meetings, staff directories, team and club photos, et cetera, um, those are all considered public pictures and videos. So can you have non-public pictures and videos on the school website? We went back and forth and got a com uh, uh, an actual hard answer on this from the OCR, but the answer is yes, you actually can. And let me give you a scenario. Let's say, uh, like a lot of our schools have teacher websites, and those teacher websites, they can actually post their lessons, they can post photos and all that stuff within there. So what the OCR is, is saying is that if a teacher has their own website within the site, 
um, and they don't have any students that are enrolled in their class on dis that are uh, disabled, they are not required to have like alt tags and things like that on their photos. But if they have just one student that has a disability, they now have to make sure that all their stuff um, has those remediations and those types of things uh, addressed. Um, so in that scenario, it makes it a little bit easier. Um, uh, you know, it takes a little bit of weight off of the schools of having to, to check everything. But that's where we're going to talk a little bit on how you set yourself up for long-term success uh, with ADA compliance. So now here's another important part. And I know a lot of you are like, you know, you might have done your own investigation to check and see how you can check for ADA compliance. We're going to give you some tools right here that you, again, can jot down. Uh, or if you want a copy of this PowerPoint, just let us know. Um, so website accessibility tools. These are the tools that are recommended to use uh, when you're trying to, to check your site for ADA compliance. One is the WAVE web accessibility tool. This is a very quick tool that basically what it does is it scans one web page on your website and checks for any compliance issues. It'll, it'll label them out by red alerts, by color contrast alerts, and let you know how many issues you have on your website. This is a tool that's commonly used by the OCR. Whenever they get a complaint, they go right in, they do a quick check on the page just to see if it needs more inve investigation. So with the, what you'll want to pay attention to if you use that tool is the red alerts and then also the color contrast. The other ones aren't, uh, aren't high priority items necessarily. Uh, they can turn into issues, but those are the two main ones that the OCR looks at whenever they go in and test a site. Uh, uh, Chrome and Firefox extensions, they have those for wave evaluation tools, so it's a one-click deal. Um, also, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, is Monsito. Uh, Monsito or Site Improve uh, are both really uh, robust companies at scanning websites, uh, finding data, finding information, and putting it in, into an easy-to-read easy format, because here's the reality of it. Unless you go, you have the time to go through every single web page in your site, check every link, check every picture, um, all of that stuff, it's going to be impossible for you to go through a whole website and understand what you need to fix. These tools help you do that. And we have actually chosen to partner with Monsito, one, because their platform, we're always about, you know, being easy to use, ease of use. We want anyone of any technical level to be able to go in and use uh, our system. We found that to be the case with Monsito. Um, also, again, because we're a company full of educators, we're always budget-minded as well in, in what we charge our customers. And Monsito is typically half the cost of what Site Improve is, and they also check for more instances in ADA compliance. So that's part of the reason we chose to partner with them uh, was uh, those main reasons. There's many other, but they, they also follow along that same model that we do. Uh, number four is Mac Accessibility VoiceOver, Chromevox, Closed Captions meaning that you want to be able to check and make sure your videos have closed captions on them. Um, when it comes to closed captions, I highly recommend number seven here, which is YouTube's automatic closed caption. So if you don't have a YouTube channel set up for your school district, I would highly recommend doing that uh, because you can set up settings in your profile to where whenever you upload a video, YouTube will automatically caption that video. So you don't have to go through that painstaking process of watching a video, pausing it, typing out what the caption is, playing it a little bit more, pausing it, and then putting the caption in. YouTube really helps you to auto automate that process and saves you tons and tons of time. Uh, so I highly recommend that. And then in our system, we make it super simple to actually embed a YouTube video into the web page as well. So it's a, it makes it real quick, real easy, and it's just the best, uh, best practice moving forward. Uh, Wave Web Aim uh, fonts and accessibility requirements. Here's some additional links. So webaim.org techniques slash fonts. This will tell you what fonts are not compliant with ADA compliance devices. Uh, for instance, and I hate to say this, but if, you, if you're involved in elementary, Comic Sans is actually not a compliant uh, font or text. So uh, you have to make sure that the types of fonts you're using, and we also do that for you on our end, making sure that you have ADA compliant fonts as your options. So no matter which font you choose out of our list, it is ADA compliant. Um, also using Word to create accessible PDFs. So Word is a great way to create an accessible PDF. So if you are creating a Word document, you can actually save it as an accessible PDF as well. We give you a great link with a three to eight minute video showing you how to do that. Also at gabber.com slash PDF, we also show you how to create accessible PDFs as well. 
Uh, so these are short, quick videos that get you some really good information. Please visit those when you have a chance, and uh, that'll really help you out as you uh, take this journey in making your website ADA compliant. So right now, before we go into any demonstrations, is there any questions for me? I'll just I'll just hover there for just a minute while I'm transitioning. But if there are any questions, please post them, um, and we'll make sure and address them for you. Okay, I'm going to transition real quick just to do a brief demonstration of some of the examples I was talking about, uh, such as the uh, uh, safety nets that we have in, and then just give you a brief high-level overview of what the Monsito tool does for our customers. So I'm going to get out of this PowerPoint. Um, I'm going to go over here to our demo site. This is one of our demo sites right here, and what I want to do is I'm actually going to log into it and show you how a uh, you know a school would actually go in and uh, apply a picture to a page and give it an alt tag without having to know HTML code or Java or anything like that. So I'm gonna log in. I'm gonna go to a page, a page on our website just by going to the, the pages section by the red bar. And then I'm just gonna go down to one of my sandbox areas where I have an empty text editor. So here's our text editor right here. And if I were to wanna put items in here, I can simply put my cursor in the text editor and then go find a photo that I wanna to use to actually apply to this page. So if I wanted to go find a photo, I can simply choose a folder to pull a photo out of. If this is the photo I wanna use, again, we wanna make this so anyone of any technical level can do this. If they just select the photo and they hit insert, there's an error that's gonna pop up and not allow them to actually post it on the website. It says right here, to be ADA compliant, you must enter a description of your image. Uh, so simply all you have to do is go to step three, this field right here, and say this is the uh, elementary logo. Once I type that in and hit insert, it'll now insert that image into the text editor. And now if anybody is using a screen reader or some type of assistive device technology, it will read off to them what that image is. So now it is fully 100% ADA compliant and now I can move on. Used to, you would have to go into the actual source code and add the alt tag to the source code. With us, we put this easy to use system and most companies out there still require you to put it in the source code. Um, but uh, this is just a, a much easier way to go in and do one of the most common mistakes that happen, which is applying a photo to the web page without giving it an alt tag. Uh, for the sake of time, that's all I'm gonna show you right now, but if you want more information, you wanna see a demo or something like that, reach out to Scott and he'll be happy to go into detail and show you how this stuff works. Uh, but that's just one of many ways we assist you in helping you uh, keep your stuff ADA compliant on the on your website. Um, the last part I'm gonna talk about is there. there's two things that need to happen to be successful. Whether you have Gabbard or not, you want to make sure one, that your company you're using now has these types of tools available and, and try to get a gauge on what their understanding of ADA compliance is. Because if you don't feel comfortable with their knowledge of ADA compliance or how they can help you, then chances are you're gonna you're gonna find yourself in some trouble. Uh, so just so dig in, investigate, and find that out from your existing providers. Okay. Um, the other part of that is is like for instance, when we create a website for a new school district, when we hand it off to you, it is 100% ADA compliant. The challenge is as time goes along and you start editing, adding content that's when it has an opportunity to come out of compliance. Um, and this is the tool that really helps you do that. And I've actually got one of our school districts pulled up where they can go in and check any compliance issues there might be. They can see where, you know, how many broken links there might be they need to fix. So there's 33 broken links, there's 14 misspellings and 13 broken images. So they know right away what the issues are and they can dig into those deeper and go right to their webpage fix it, save it, move on, and go to the next issue, fix it, save it, move on. Uh, again, the challenge to most of you, if most of you are tech directors or things like that, is one, knowing what to look for. Uh, number two is, is being able to fix it efficiently. Um, this helps you do all of that and then some. So this dashboard right here gives you a ton of good information of where you can go in and see what's going on, what issues there might be, if you're wanting to do accessibility only, uh, get statistics on your website. This is more than just a one-trick pony of checking for ADA compliance stuff. It actually 
helps you have a better website. It'll check things like your readability, uh, meaning well, like what grade level does your website read at? If it's a very difficult grade level, like it's a very high level of readability, that may not be the best route to go because your younger audiences or those that have challenges or disabilities may not be able to read at that level. Um, so keeping those types of things in mind as you go through it really helps you go through in detail and see what's going on and address any issues that might come up. Um, so this tool married with the Gabbert product is honestly the best way to, to ensure your ADA success, uh, not only immediately, but also long term as well. Um, so that, that is really a high level overview of these services and ADA compliance information. So what I'll do right now is I'll again, open it up for questions because I'm done with this part. Um, but, uh, Jace and Brandon, if you guys have anything that you want to add, uh, feel free to do so, but we'll, uh, we'll open it up for questions right now. If anybody has any. Chris, there aren't any questions coming in right now, but I think we're we're right on track here, and it seems to be going well. Okay, great. Okay, great. Once again, uh, I think they put one for okay. me. So, yeah. what is the cost of these two systems? Yes. So we base it on student count. So depending on how big your student your school district is, um, ultimately determines what the cost is of the web hosting services. Uh, mobile app and notification. Uh, you can also do like an a la carte. Like for instance, if you just want to do the website and you don't want to do the mobile app yet, you can build it. And we have a lot of schools that build in stages. Um, but we base it off all, all of the uh, the student count for the district, uh, primarily because it gets a fair cost and also um, helps those smaller schools as well too have the same access to the what the larger schools do. Because when you purchase our product, um, there, if, if there's a certain product set, like if you've chosen the website, you get full access to the website, exactly as the same as the 45,000 student school district that we serve. You get all the same features, all the same functions as they do. It's just the cost is based more around what your budget is based on your student count. Um, so, you know, at just as far as a quote, things like that, get with Scott and we'll be happy to run a quote for you and get some information. Um, and even set up a demo to cover that. I can tell you though, based on your website, um, depending on how many web pages you have in your site, ultimately determines the cost of the Monsito product. So you can actually see different things like, um, let me go out here. Let me go to my desktop real quick. So right here, it's based on pages. There's like a page range. So depending on how many pages you have on your site, will tell you what the cost is, and that's not the right one. One more. I think this one is it. Yes, right here. So let me uh, let me pull this up and make this larger. So here's what the costs are. So depending on how many web pages you have on your website, which part of the scan we can do for free, is we will actually do a free scan for you via the Montito tool. That one, that will tell us how many pages you have. The other is it will also uh, tell you what kinds of issues you have on the site. Um, that will kind of give you a head start to look at, uh, you know, what you might start addressing first. Uh, but right here, you'll see these ranges, depending on how many pages you have, there's the annual cost over to the right-hand side. Um, so those are the types of things you see. And again, these costs are extremely competitive. And again, uh, they normally, typically when I see a bid come out for Site Improve, which does the same thing, just not quite as good, uh, end up being about half the cost, almost to the penny, exactly almost half the cost of what uh, a Site Improve uh, uh, bid comes out as. Um, and then the other parts of it, again, that all just depends on what services you want to get pricing on, um, and then also whatever your student count uh, is for your district. Any other questions? That's excellent. And, and just so you know, if you, if you look in the chat box, I did put Scott's contact information in there. So if you want special pricing for your school district, or to have a uh, further conversation about how they might be able to help you guys out, make sure to jot that information down and reach out to Scott. Absolutely. 
Scott, is there anything you want to add to, before we wrap things up here? Uh, no, that's it. I mean, great job, Chris, on the uh, presentation. And, and and I've already got somebody to email me to, to send over the PowerPoint, so I'll be happy to send those over. Just feel free to reach out to me. At, uh, you can call me directly or email me at scott at gabbert.com, and uh, I'll be able to forward the PowerPoint to you as well. And if you have any questions regarding uh, uh, quotes or anything like that, or uh, demonstrations, happy to help with those as well. And, and, and Brandon, again, thank you guys so much for allowing us this opportunity today. Absolutely. Thanks to you guys from Gabbert, Scott, and Chris. And uh, for, for everybody who's viewing this, um, we're going to, we'll, we'll make sure to get this loaded up to our YouTube page as quickly as we can. And uh, then you can access this and, and rewatch it, or if, if you'd be interested in sending it to some, uh, other people in your district who would be interested in that information, feel free to uh, send them link, the link to that as well. So with that, I think we'll wrap up. Again, thank you guys so much for your time. We really appreciate you spending your time with us today, and uh, we'll look forward to connecting again down the road.